Welcome to this exciting video on the early church in Australia. Don't forget to pause the video, rewind the video, and to take notes. So the idea is not to write everything. What you think is the most important, just write a couple of notes down. Maybe by the end you'll get about a page. Also during this presentation, I really encourage you to pause the video and teach the person next to you. Because when somebody like me lectures you, you only have about 10 to 15% chance of remembering. But if you flip the role around and become the teacher, that percentage goes up to 80, 90%. Are you ready? Let's go. So why Australia? The loss of the war, of the American independence led to the settling of the white man, so the colonialists, on the shores of Australia. From 1718 to 1776, British convicts had been sent in considerable numbers annually until contractors into servitude in the American mainland. The colony of New South Wales was established as a convict settlement by an order in council dated the 6th of September 1785. So the first settlement. On the 13th of May 1787, the first fleet provisioned for two years left England with 1,030 souls on board, so people, of whom 696 were convicts. They reached Botany Bay on the 20th of January 1788. The men who founded Sydney and the Commonwealth of Australia may have been convicts, but they were not necessarily criminals, such as what we are familiar with today. Within the next decade, the ranks of the original convict population was swelled by a goodly percentage of 1,300 unoffending Catholic peasants from the north and west of Ireland. After the insurrection of 1798, a stream of Irish political prisoners poured into the penal settlement of Botany Bay, and they played some part in the early history of Australian colonies and especially of Australian Catholicism. So convictism endured in New South Wales from its foundation in 1788 all the way up to 1840 and Tasmania remained a penal colony until 1853. Western Australia began as a penal settlement in 1826. It continued as such for only a very brief space. Two noted Catholic ecclesiastics, Dr. Althrone and Dr. Wilson, first Bishop of Hobart, took a prominent and honoured part in the long, slow movement which led to the ab abolition of the convict system in New South Wales, Tasmania and Norfolk Island. So now's the time to pause the video and teach the person next to you. Work out who's going to be the teacher, who's going to be the student. And there's more than one way to teach, such as by drawing, writing, or gesturing. Please pause the video now. Let's keep going. Awesome. So Anglican by force. The Anglicanism, so the Church of England, was de facto religion in Australia at the time of the first settlement. So realize the church was aligned to the state or the government. All convicts were forced to attend the Anglican church. Penalties for refusal consisted of reduced rations, imprisonment, confinement, imprisoned in hulks and the stocks. So the Catholic population in 1792, there were 300 Catholic convicts and 50 Catholic freemen in New South Wales. Nine years later, in 1801, there were over 5,515 inhabitants in the penal settlement, and one-third of them were Catholic. The period of persecution, a convict named Bernard Trainer was sentenced to 14 days imprisonment in Brighton Jail for refusing to attend a Protestant service. This abuse of power continued in, in Tasmania until 1844. It was not until 1813 that Method Methodism made a feeble beginning in Australia, along with Presbyterianism in 1823 and other Protestant churches at later dates. Anglican Church, so the Church of England, was the official church. So don't forget to pause the video now, teach the person next to you, describe the religious practice in early Australia.
Awesome, let's keep going. Three priests who had been unjustly transported on a charge of complicity in the Irish insurrection of 1798. So back over in Ireland in that year, all these Irish sort of rebelled and many of them were taken and obviously transported to Sydney and, and Australia as convicts. That included Father James Harold, James Dixon and Peter O'Neill. They were initially strictly forbidden to exercise any sacred ministry of the Catholic Mass, so they couldn't celebrate the Catholic Church service. Catholic priests were seen as political aligned with the political leadership in opposition to the English colony. However, in 1803, these Catholic priests were permitted to celebrate Mass once a month. After a little more than a year, Father Dixon's pre precious privilege was withdrawn at the last state of the Catholic Church convicts became worse than the first. And in 1808, Dixon returned to Ireland. In 1817, a deep spiritual desolation brooded over the infant church in Australia. In the last mentioned year, there were 6,000 Catholics in Sydney alone. The government of the day saying, no pompish missionary will be allowed to intrude within the settlement, and that every person in the penal colony must be Protestant. So don't forget, pause the video, teach the person next to you, what was the early Catholic practice like? Describe. Let's keep going. So a little bit more about James Dixon. So he was a Roman Catholic priest. He was born in Castlebridge County, Wexford in Ireland. He was educated by a neighboring parish priests and later at Slamenka and Louvain, where he completed his course in 1784. He became a curate in Crossenburg Parish near Wexford. He was arrested in 1798 under the Sabisa suspicion of taking part in the Irish Rebellion. He trailed by the court and convicted on shanky evidence, found guilty and sentenced to death. Luckily, he was reprieved conditional on his being transported for life. Arriving in New South Wales on the ship, the Friendship, on the 16th of January 1800, Governor Philip Gidley King in 1803 granted him conditional emancipation and permission to exercise his priestly duties as a priest. Dixon was obliged to take the oath of allegiance and abdication, but was allowed to minister as a priest as long as he and his congregation strictly obeyed the governor's orders. The Holy See, so the Pope, recognized the advantage to the Catholic convicts on this permission. However, in on the 15th of May, 1803, the first public mass under the new regulations was celebrated in Sydney. But the Castle Hill Rebellion, in that same time, approximately 300 Irish convicts took up arms and tried to overthrow the British rulers. So basically what they did, they were at a settlement at Castle Hill. Um, they overthrew their, I suppose, their British soldier guards and they moved south to where the um, government house was down in Parramatta, where Parramatta Park is today. Without success, Dixon accompanied Major George Johnson and the government troops and tried to remonstrate with the rebels. This did not work. So Dixon actually tried to stop them and convince them to stop what they're doing because obviously being violent, taking up arms is not a good thing. Definitely not a Christian thing. The re rebellious were outgunned in the foothills of Parramatta, near Parramatta Park today. So the, the, the cannon's still there today, and basically they were obliterated. On the 1st of March, 1804, the public mass was put to an end. And, bec and because the king believed that, especially after the rising of the Irish convicts, seditious meetings took place at Catholics as they met during mass. So he continued to practice privately in the colony, as the evidence of baptisms and marriages shows. He was described in 1806 muster as a Roman Catholic priest self-employed. In 1808, Dixon returned to Ireland. So he died on the 4th of January, 1840, where he's buried at Crossenburg Chapel. So again, pause the video, teach the person next to you about who was James Dixon and what did he do?
Let's keep going. Then we have Father Jeremiah O'Flynn. So he was a Catholic priest. He was born in the 25th of December, 1788 in Ireland. He studied with the Franciscans at Killari. He entered the Cistercian Monastery at La Worth Abbey in England, where he became a monk in the La Trappe Reform. So in 1813, O'Flynn was ordained a deacon and was he went with the Trappist monks to establish a missionary in the West Indies, today Indonesia, which is sort of north of Australia. In April of 1816, he was charged with intrusion and incompetence. He went back to Rome to seek answers to these charges. Under the influence of Father Hayes, representative of the Irish Catholic Association in Rome, he urged him to secure priests for the Irish convicts in Australia, in the in the colony. O'Flynn went to Dublin in November of 1816 to seek additional help from Irish bishops. He arrived in Sydney on the 9th of November 1817 on the colony, to the colony. He told Governor Macquarie he had Bathurst's permission to serve as a priest, but he was not, he had no proof. So Basically, he didn't believe him. So Macquarie ordered him to leave immediately at the same ship. O'Flynn rejected this and went and performed baptisms so secretly and marriages as well as celebrating mass in private homes. So he basically rode around on horseback throughout the colony um, doing these services. So he was caught and um, sent back. So he was here about six months. He sailed out on the 20th of May, 1818, although 400 free Catholics protested for O'Flynn to stay in New South Wales. O'Flynn often clashed with colonial office, helped to publicise the needs of Catholics in New South Wales. This influenced the government in 1820 in allowing the first official Roman Catholic priest to come to Australia. So he died on the 8th of February, 1831 in the United States in Philadelphia. In 1818, O'Flynn was arrested without warrant or accusation, placed under lock and key in prison and without trial, shipped back to London as a prisoner. But before his arrest, he used to practice the sacred mysteries, so the mass, in the house of a pious Catholic named Davis on the grounds where the Morris Church today stands at St. Patrick's Church Hill. These sacred mysteries placed were reserved for the sick and dying. And what O'Flynn actually did was he left a host um, at that site, at the Davies house, where Catholics would come and secretly um, pray in front of um, so the, the Blessed Sacrament, the presence of Jesus. And that remained for about two years until the next Catholic priest arrived. Um, yeah, at, at the next Mass. And... Um, yeah, at, at St. Patrick's Church Hill, you can actually go down underground. It's about, I don't know, four, five, six meters under the street level where this actually was. So don't forget, pause the video. Time to teach the person next to you. Why was O'Flynn extraordinary? Let's keep going. The period of partial toleration. So in 1821, in New South Wales and Tasmania contained a white population of 35,610 people. 30% of them were Catholic. In a census taken in 1828, there were about 36,000 white Australians, of whom about 11,000 were Catholic. Realised that Protestants were actually forbidden from joining the Catholic Church. Um, by this stage, there were four Catholic schools and four churches under constructions. Tasmania at the time only had one priest, no school and one church. In 1836, the Catholic Church was given freedom to practice their beliefs openly. One year later, Tasmania was granted this also. During the governorship of Sir Richard Burke, Catholics were allowed to immigrate to Australia. In 1834, Reverend John B. Polding, an English Benedictine, was appointed Australia's first Catholic bishop. In 1841, the diocese contained 30,000 people or Catholics, which were ministered by 28 priests. In 1841, Australia and Tasmania together had risen to a population of about 211,000. There were 35,000 Catholics out of approximately 130,000 people in New South Wales. The Pope created new dioceses which were in Hobart in 1842, Adelaide in 1843, Perth in 1845, and Melbourne, Maitland and Port Victoria in 1848. 
priests opened a mission for Aboriginals at Stradbroke Island in 1843. In 1844, the first meeting of bishops known as the Synod was held in New South Wales. A census in 1851 showed that Catholic body had risen to about 59,000 of the total population of 191,000. So pause the video. What three significant things happened between the 1820s and 1850s for Catholics? What, what changes occurred? Pause the video. Almost finished. For a long period, Australian officials and ex-officials were to all intents purposes a great ring of spiritual dealers. The cost of building the first Protestant church in Australia was in part paid by the sale of rum. So rum selling and rum distilling debauched the convicts and their guards. So they were selling it on one hand, using it for government purposes, and obviously the convicts were drinking it. The reformation or rehabilitation of the criminals formed no part of the convict system in Australia. English governments were important rather, rather than the sole. However, widening influences of religion as time went on saw the development of spiritual resources, prosperity and education. So overall, you can see that the Catholic Church in Australia struggled for the first, say, from 1788 to 1840, so a little bit over 30 years. Um, for most of that time, it was illegal to be Catholic. And basically, the church grew through the leadership of the laity. There were um, priests that appeared at different times, such as Dixon and O'Flynn, but the laity were the ones who kept the church alive. So it wasn't until about 1821 where the first priests were allowed to come. So the struggle of our church in Australia. Um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Have a great day. Bye-bye.